a very important algorithm called Kalman filtering, which we got originally from the NASA's satellite tracking systems. Okay, so Kalman filtering has various, various different uh, different types of Kalman filtering. The ones we're going to study today is called discrete Kalman filtering. Okay, so first we will understand what is recursive estimation. Then we'll go on into appreciating what is a Kalman filter, and then we'll try to visualize solution and also look at a little bit of the math that goes behind the scene in its implementation. So first, from a recursive compute perspective, let us appreciate how it is really done. We'll take this most simplest example where we are saying, look, we have been given a bunch of estimates or some numbers, Z1 to Zn, where it is just a sequence of measurements, okay? And what we want to do is we want to compute the mean of this particular sequence of numbers. Usually, what do we do? We just take an average. We, we compute an average and do it. But now, let us see what is the difference between just computing an average as is versus computing it them recursively. So for that, we have to do some step-by-step -step operation. So first, when we want to do naive mean computation, what are we actually doing? Let's go through the steps. The first step is we will be storing Z1. We will say the mean is M1, which is Z1. So this is the naive algorithm, okay? In the next sequence, once the second math sequence comes into us, what do we do? We take Z2, we store both Z2 and Z1, and then we are going to be computing the mean like the Z1 plus Z2 by 2. Third measurement when it comes to us, what do we do? We take Z3 also, and then we will compute the mean as Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 by 3. Yeah, we would do that till the end operation in a very naive compute. This is very inefficient and naive. The problem with this approach is number one, it is inefficient in the compute way. And also we are storing all the data points. So it's also inefficient from a memory space perspective. Can we do better? That's where recursive algorithms start coming in. So given this sort of a series, what we essentially will do when we take the recursive compute, recursive mean estimation algorithm, is that it is first time going to obviously store the mean as the Z1 because that is the first estimate that it received or the first sequence number that it got. Okay. Then it stores only the mean that it has right now, which is same as Z1, but it, it just stores that and it discards the series. Right now, Z1. When the second measurement Z2 comes in, it does a small compute to the mean. So it basically is going to update my mean. It says the mean at the second time step is equal to half the mean the first time step plus half the mean of second time step. But this time, second time step, it is the actual measurement of Z2 that it received. So thus, it will store the M2 and it will only store M2 and it will discard M1, which was the earlier known mean, and also Z2, which is the observation it received. All right. So this, it keeps doing again and again and again. And here, we only store the last estimated mean. That's the key idea here. And we figured out a way for us to compute this updated mean using an equation. So we'll see that equation in a minute. So we can continue to do this also for Z3. So the M3 becomes two-third of M2 plus one-third of Z3. So we will again store M3 to be the updated last known mean and we'll discard M2 and Z3. Finally, we can obviously generalize how this M is being computed at each time step. When the new information comes in, we compute the M based on N minus 1 by N into the last known mean plus 1 by N times the measurement that came in. So this is the the recursive mean calculation equation. You may have seen it if you have done time series processing or some sort of sequence processing. And this is fairly taken for granted in, let's say, some sort of a financial trading or that, that sort of sequence play uh, systems where the next, we don't know what is going to come next. And obviously, we need to compute sequentially, recursively. Okay, So this is the very basic equation. Now, essentially, all we have seen is we can compute the mean very naively and thus be inefficient or use this kind of a method. We are going to use this idea of recursive compute to another scale, and that scale is going to be the generalized version 
or with which we are going to talk about Kalman filtering. The important benefits, obviously, of a recursive procedure is it uses the previous steps. It, it retains only one mean compute, and there is a very minimum numerical compute done using the new measurement. Okay. So it's quite, quite important, and it's also efficient. So let's now see the key ideas behind Kalman filtering now that we know what is recursive compute. Because recursive compute is the core with which Kalman filter works. The key idea is, number one, let us say over a period of time, we are going to be tracking an object. So in this context, we are going to make it simple. We're going to track an object in 2D space. Okay? So this is sort of my, my space where I'm tracking the object 2D. The object could be anything. It could be a, a spacecraft. It could be a, a stock market uh, price. Could be a rover running up our tower. So whatever it is, we just have some path that we know. Question is, where is it going to be next? Okay, so that is kind of the space where we're coming in. We want to make a prediction where the object would be at next time period or whatever the particular business objectives are. To get the terminologies right, let's call the black line as the state of the object. Okay, this black line is the state of the object. This is the real state. Okay, but in many cases, we may not even be able to see the state, but you just need to know that this black line is a state, and the process that generates this state is called the state process. So there's going to be a process. We are making an assumption that it is a logical or intelligent process that keeps generating new, new states. And that process is going to be called the state process. Okay. Now we're going to put a twist to this to bring it to the real world. What if this black is not directly observable? Then how can we predict the next step? So this twist is the real, the reality, the life. We really cannot observe this out of out of what we currently have, like many of the data that we are capturing from that particular rover or particular stock markets symbol, or, or it could be any other object that we're tracking. So the real state is not seen, then how can we predict the next possible move of that particular object? But what we have been told is that even though the real state is not seen, we can see some positions some indicative positions of that object, which is pointed in green. Okay, It won't be perfectly aligned with the state because there'll be errors in it. And these are GPS positions. Maybe it is coming from a far away distance or it could be about a stock market sing symbol, which is going through a lot of volatile period emotions. Okay, So thus the noise present in it will make sure that it is a noisy set of observations from which directly inferring this using the human eye or just a vanilla uh, linear function is not going to happen. Okay? That we can be very clear. But this itself is, is a good step that we have some observations. And what we are going to call those observations in technical terminology is the measurement. Okay? All right, very good. Now we're going to coin the prediction problem. So on the right side here, because I spoke about noise, I've now thrown in a very important noise element that is there in many, many mathematical calculations called the weight Gaussian noise. Okay. This weight Gaussian noise is about the controlled noise that we can put into our experiments and get some good benefits. That is the key idea. Okay. So I will explain that in a bit, but right now know that a lot of times people will say, I'm injecting a weight Gaussian noise into the system. That means they are doing a controlled noise into the system for them to learn something about the system. Okay. So the prediction problem is we observe discrete measurements, which are noisy. We do not observe the real state. We need to predict the real state for the next time step using the noise and discrete measurements. Okay. So the key thing is we need to predict the next real state so that we know 
where that object is going to be or that stock is going to be. Make assumptions. What is that? The noise of measurement from that particular object is weight noise. So this is a, a fundamental assumption that we're going to make at this stage for our mathematics to work easily. Later on, you can relax the assumption a little bit more and make it more and more complex. Okay, so that's the idea. All right. So I've so far only given you a conceptual view that Kalman filtering is a recursive algorithm and that it is going to try solve a predictive problem. That is all I've given you. But I'm going to now show it to you visually from my own running of Python code for tracking an object. Okay, so let's first see. Our goal is to track an object moving in the 3D space. So I do have some information that has been given to me, which is in 3D space, and I'm going to be tracking that object. The only information available to us at this stage is the location and the velocity of that object, and a bunch of series of noise, which we know is already part of that object's measurement. Okay, So we don't have the real state, we only have measurements. And we visualize them in 2D space. All right. So this kind of object tracking, even though I have generalized it as object tracking, it just has quite a bit of applications that exist. Okay. Today we don't have SUMA, but otherwise this is a very perfect case for an industrial noise where people are observing machineries. Okay. And then it obviously is applicable to stock market, economic data. Why is why is it applicable to economic data? It's just a measurement. Uh, we don't measure every population. Last we, we, we discussed it. We sample. So when we do those sampling, certain noises start coming in. And then it's applicable to things in the IoT space like drone signal processing and stuff. Okay. So let's see this. So I'm now going to show you some of the results of what I observed. So these are all my observed measurements in the 2D space. It's just scattered all over. Usually, what do we do? We will think that this is a possible regression space within the 2D, even though we know this is the 3D. And then we will try to fit them. Isn't it? People will try to go and fit a regression when they see something like this. And they say, look, my regressor is running through it. And then these is kind of the errors that it goes through. Correct? We've, we've, we've had many people do it. And that regression need not be just a linear regression. It could be polynomial regression as well because it'll then start to bend around. But with Kalman filtering, it takes a slightly different approach. It says, look, recursively, as the objects start coming in, can I start predicting where the real state is? That is kind of what it keeps asking again and again and again. And when it does it, it makes an estimate of where that state is according to its own best effort, okay? Based on the noise assumption it made, based on the next item that's coming in, measurement coming in, it keeps making that estimation. So this blue line is the estimation that Kalman filtering made. And this yellow line, or this orangish line, is the one that is the real state, which is hidden, but we are now drawing it to understand how well our Kalman filter is doing with the real, real world state. So right now I've done tracking for time, 25 steps. Let's take it more. Now I'm starting to do tracking for 50 steps. See what happens. As it goes on for a larger period of time, Kalman filtering is starting to show much higher conversion, convergence back into the space. Okay. And this kind of movements, which are fairly unorthodox if one is taking the, the regression space, is one of the bigger benefits of keeping a Kalman filter in place. Very good. See here, absolute V curve after 100 iterations. What will happen to the regressor? It'll try to satisfy everything, right? Polynomial, unless you have a very high order polynomial, it won't fit like this. So this is the 100th, then let me see the 125th, 25 more, and it starts fairly close to the real. Real is much smoother, obviously our estimate is a bit noisy, but it's getting better and better and better. What is it getting better and better? That is something we're going to see. We're going to see when we see the maths. Okay. So thus, object tracking wise, Kalman filter 
was identified to be very effective based on NASA's own observations in real life. And also later on, various applications have been done. Okay, so here, see here. And this particularly intrigued me because in the in the notebooks I ran and stuff, you see here the real has already gone out. Hellman filter is struggling to catch up to the reality. And this is real life, where we have to then figure out how this piece could potentially start converging back. And what is it that makes the difference that this was converging better here, but not converging here? And for us to really appreciate that, that inner knowledge, we have to see that math. Okay, so that is kind of the motivation I want to give you guys for why we need to study the underlying math so we can start visualizing where the possible deviations are. Thus, we can take out some of those elements and really assess, analyze them. Fine. Let's now look into the algorithm itself. So what it says is, look, there is something called as a state process, which is the real world process of generating these observations. Okay. And we are going to put some connotations to it, which is like we are saying, look, the real world process of k plus 1, so next time step in the real step process, is derived based on the previous time step for the k and some terms here. Okay. One is multiplied, another one is added. So let's see what they are. One is a state evolution, obviously. What is added here is how this can get transitioned into a k plus one. So we have to learn either a transition matrix or somebody has to tell us that this machine has a, a certain type of a transition matrix. And that's my current state. And then what is getting added is kind of the noise. We said the weight noise is used in the industry quite often for us to be able to model processes. And in this particular case, we are use, using the weight noise because it's making the mathematics much simpler. Okay, When people go and change it to other noises, they obviously will have to extend and derive a few more things, and this thing keeps get growing longer. Right now, we're sticking with weight noise, which means it's a noise with a known covariance and a zero mean. One observe assumption that we have is that we are not going to observe the real world process. Which means the state at time xk, is that observable? Maybe not, if we are making that assumption. So which means we have to some way derive an approximation to xk using the measurements. So let's see the measurement. Okay, A measurement process is going to focus on what I observe, which is exactly the zk, not xk. I cannot observe xk. That is the assumption we made. So zk we observe. We have a mapping matrix, which is going from a real to observed. This is taking me from the xk space to the zk space. That obviously have to be learned. And obviously a measurement error. So we do continue in that same weight noise space of measurement error. But now we have a function of how we're going to use this xk, which we don't even see. But we do see zk. Okay, So we have made this assumption that zk is connected to xk based on some mapping matrix of real to observed along with some noise. Okay. So this is what is called as the measurement process. Earlier one was called the state process. So these two equations are fundamental to Kalman filtering. Then now we have to estimate the next state. How do we go from a measurement to the state estimation? That is the question. So xk with that tilde is the estimate of the state at time k. And the same tilde with a minus is the estimate of a priori estimate of the state. Okay, the previous one, last known. So now we're going to put this equation together, which is we are saying, look, I know that xk directly cannot be observed. Can I make an estimate of that x, xk, knowing that I have a measurement process already defined and a state process I have already defined? 
the estimated new state is a function of my last known estimated state plus some factor of some blending factor of the error deviations between my real state and my estimated state or rather my observed ra minus the estimation so observation minus estimation will going to give me an error that error is weighted by some factor and then added back in to the previous known estimated state for me to get the state estimated at this point in time okay is everyone clear because this is the step that is tying the two other equations we saw Then comes a question, what is the performance criteria for this optimization? How do we know the performance criteria? We obviously have to make one assumption. We have to go into that. And our assumption right now is we are going to be minimizing the mean square error. Okay. And what are we optimizing? We are optimizing this particular equation, which is how to go from how to make an estimation of the state using your measurement process. Okay. So we obviously have a blending factor that weighs the error. And the optimization we really want to do is we want to minimize this error. So the moment we can minimize the error between what our estimators to this observation, this itself is an adjusted the observation process, the process is there. If we can minimize that, then that means we are getting closer and closer to the real state. That's what it really means. So there are obviously multiple unknowns in this and we are going to be learning them along the way as part of this recursive estimation. Okay. And there's a very important terminology that you will hear all the time, which is called Kalman gain. Okay. For any given covariance matrix, so this is a generic covariance matrix that we have now rewritten it back in X terminology, which is our state. At any point in time, state minus estimated state into the state minus estimated state, which is the square of them. The estimation of that square is going to give me the covariance matrix in a transport matrix terminology. We want to find the optimal k for the covariance matrix pk. Okay, that is kind of going to be part of our goal. Again, terminologies are xk is my estimated state at time k, and this is the previous estimate that we made at time ideally k minus 1, a priori estimate. After people did the optimization and then they derived, this is the equation that runs the show. For your optimal k to be derived, or rather I should say the kk is my Kalman gale for the, for the optimal convergence of observed to the reality, we are going to be gaining something which we are going to call as a Kalman gain. And what that really is standing for is all these terms are in K, are in K's term. Yeah? That too, there is some HK now brought in. Okay? We have to understand what that is. But fundamentally, there are going to be HK terms coming in and also there are going to be some errors that are getting added in. Okay, we'll clarify what that is. So just keep this in mind that there is something going on with the optimal, optimal uh, convergence for us to have the optimal convergence. There is a concept of Kalman gain. And now let's look at this algorithmic loop to further uh, kind of like clarify what really is going on behind the scene. Okay. So this is the algorithmic loop that is going on behind the scene. So first, what happens is, there is going to be some prior estimate of a finger in the air or some sort of a mean or some sort of an estimate on the actual state we are going to be making. And when we make that estimate, we also have to make how much variance is there in that estimate, right? So this is statistics. So we have to not talk about point estimate, but we have to also give the variance which means there is some underlying distribution behind the scene. 
okay with those two and these hk is already being calibrated out from the process what happens is we have the kalman gain computer which gives me the k factor which is initially it is going to be some very random number because some of these are not even known these have to be learned as it goes through the loop the next step is it basically is going to see the actual observations coming in and it is going to spit out my real state these are my observations noisy observations coming in and it is going to help spit out my real state as it is okay and this is important because this is where the x hat is being computed once we know what the x hat is at that point in time let's say i have only two observations that came in so i've got x0 and x1 i have in place then what we need to do is we need to put both the observations perspectives which is driven off the kk's and hk's to compute my error covariances once my error covariance is there what it tells me is so how much error really is there between my measurement sorry the measurement here and my actual that is what it is computed here and once i understand how much error is there what do we want to do we really wanted to minimize it but at this stage that minimization is happening out here what rather what we will do is we'll use this error to compute the projection forward okay so we compute the projection forward which means we will update this estimated x0 or x uh, whatever that time step is and also we will update the p which is one more equation that is going into the kalman gain so we continue to do this process again and again and again fundamentally computing a notion called kalman gain which is nothing but an optimization piece and once this optimization piece is in place we obviously Uh, use that to churn out the actual state according to the system then once the state according to the system has come out we see the difference between the observed and the actual that our system has estimated we call that the error so we further adjust that error and use it to make the next step prediction once the next step prediction is there that step goes back in again to update the kalman gain so does the system initially will be garbage but over a period of time as it sees more and more sequence what it really learns is how much is these two varying how much is these two varying statistically okay and optimize it to make sure that these two are closer and closer from our estimation perspective okay sorry the errors are minimized these two may not get closer and closer these two can vary because this is my observation this is my estimation these two errors are the errors if we can minimize it with the reality which gets computed as part of the kalman gain then my problem is solved so this is what is happening in a discrete kalman filter algorithm 